Hi, I'm Alexander Yaffe. I'm the lead maintainer of Quill. Um, it is a library that is made to bring back the sanity into working with SQL. And um, as a side effect, you become sane. Normally working with SQL is not sane. Um, this library is supposed to make it become sane. And so we'll talk a little bit about why that's the case. We'll talk for a second about some of the new capabilities that Scala 3 brings, why Zio is probably the best way of handling database effects in general, and how some things from the ecosystem like Caliban really take things to the next level. Now, okay, in the beginning, I had a product. I had a product that was supposed to serve up an API endpoint, and it was a query, and it was simple, and life was good. And then it got more complex, and more complex, and more complex, and more complex, and suddenly we introduce a second business unit. And it's like, okay, we have a second business unit, what do we do? Well, as in all products using SQL, you copy the SQL, because there actually is no better alternative in SQL than copying a query. Right? You can do composition with strings, but then you'll go crazy in another way. Right? There is actually no better thing, not with views, not with table returning views, not with, not with any kind of UDF or table returning UDF. There is no better alternative to actually copying SQL code, because there is no polymorphism. I will go head to head with like any enterprise architect that claims on otherwise. There is nothing better in SQL than copying a query. Well, if we had polymorphism, there would be. This is what it would be, right? If SQL had polymorphism, this is what it would be, right? You go from this to this, right? And all I did here was I took all of the common parts that these two queries had and I just abstracted them out, right? Because nearly identical for most part of the structure, but no. There is no such thing. So then, okay, we keep on going on our approach, and it becomes more complex, and more complex, and more complex, and suddenly we introduce a third business unit, and then we are chewing our own skin off because of all the crazy copied complexity. Now again, if we just had polymorphism, it would be this, right? Pretty darn easy if we just were able to abstract out the common parts. But again, SQL has no polymorphism. It probably never have polymorphism. It does not have a type system, okay? However, what is the purpose of libraries like Quill? It is to go from this to this, right? This is almost what you would want to have in SQL. This is almost the polymorphic API that you wish you had that would make you become sane again, okay? So, all right, this is, this is sanity, right? But here's the thing, right? So this, this, you still need to generate a query, right? This needs to generate this. Well, how do you know that this generates this? It could generate this, right? This is slick. If you do this kind of equivalent thing in slick, this is what you get. Trust me, you do not want to debug this query for the first time ever in production, right? We're like, in production, this is the first time that you ever see this query, right? And you're like tracing what's x2, what's x3 across like multiple layers of things. So how do you know that this is the query that gets produced? Well, here's how. Right? You press your compile button and out comes your query. This is what we will execute. Right? And so this is, this, is why, this is why I learned to love Quill very, very quickly, because it actually gives you that. It actually tells you, this is exactly what we will execute. And by the way, you could give it to your DBAs. You could say, you know, oh, by the way, make an index on it. Do whatever you need to optimize this thing, because you know in advance. And by the way, we also optimize the query. For example, something to know about database optimizers. They hate deep nested queries, especially deep nested queries with unions. Because the amount of different possibilities with deep nested unions the database optimizers have to do is like Pow! It explodes, right? Because you need to do a Cartesian product of every single outer nesting, right? So database optimizers love big flat queries because they're really good about doing small local optimizations and they're really horrible at reasoning about an entire query. That's why Quill attempts to flatten your query. But guess what? Whatever it is, we give it to you. This is what we'll execute. Now, we need some helper methods. Okay, we'll have some helper methods to do this. However, there's a funny little thing here, this quote thing. Like, why can't we, why can't we just do a normal method? Why do we have to have all these values that are defined as lambdas in order to be able to do this dot two customer thing? Well, here's why, right? Because it needs to be in this quote thing. It needs to be in this quote thing because we need to be able to run it inside the macro engine, right? So we can't do normal methods because normal methods have arguments and those arguments have values and we don't know what the values will be at compile time, okay? However, a lot of this changes in Scala 3, which is where I want to take us today 
First of all, in Scala 3, we can have regular extension methods. Second of all, we have inline parameters. And inline parameters actually are swapped in at compile time. The value is swapped in at compile time. So guess what? First of all, type aliases, fine. We used to use refine types. But more importantly, we don't need quotes anymore. We don't need quoted things anymore, which means that we can use regular methods. Their arguments have to be inline, but we can use completely normal methods to be able to compose queries at compile time. Oh, by the way, we can use type classes to, compile, to, um, to compose things at compile time too, right? This is like Scala 3 idiomatic type classes that have extension methods on them. We can do that. But what I really like is being able to do actual compile time control flow logic, right? You can actually, if there are certain conditions under which this works, but so long as you actually let the compiler reason about the control flow, it can actually do all the substitutions and plug in the control flow, and it actually knows which thing is going to manifest, right? Normally, you can't do this. Normally, it doesn't know what the value of the variable will be at compile time. Well, guess what? With inline, it does. And it actually does all of the code substitutions that it needs to do at compile time. Now, OK, so we have this nice little composition. What do we do with the output? Right? We're here at Zeo World. We know better than to just sit around and wait for a result. So, OK, fine. We, you know, we want to start with some kind of task future implementation of some sort. Many of you know where I'm going with this, but bear with me for a second. Right? So, OK, fine. We need to manage a connection. We need a connection because we need to be able to produce a record. To manage a connection, we need a context to manage the connection. To have a context, we need to have a factory of some kind that gives the correct things into the context, which means that we then need to be able to use that whole thing in order to be able to actually put things into our query, like runtime values. Now, guess what? We need to encode those things into the SQL prepared statements, which means we need to have we need to have actual type-dependent values inside of those encoders, which means we need to have a context in which we append the type-dependent type -dependent values, and all of our programmatic logic needs to live inside of these things that are cake-patterned onto our original context. This is pretty nasty, OK? So what's the alternative? Well, just pass in the configuration and the factories that we need at the last minute. right? We just wait until the end. OK, well, maybe we want this thing that we pass in to be flat mappable, and we get reader monad. OK, great. All right, now, if we really want to model this correctly, then we want to be able to model the fact that we have errors in this thing. OK, so here's the thing. Is the error out here? Or is it here? Or is it here? Is it before the query is run? Is it after the query is run? Is it before after preparation? And does the user even care about any of that stuff? OK, step back for a second. What are the three things that this thing can do? It can return a record, it can throw some trash, and it takes some dependency from somewhere, right? Like, it's like a factory, right? Produces things, consumes things, and also occasionally produces trash. Well, guess what? Every single object-oriented method of every object-oriented language works like this. Java, C Sharp, C++, every single object-oriented method actually does these three things. Which is why, ta-da! Right? Right? It's no surprise that Zio ports well to other object-oriented languages. It is a way to do good functional programming in object-oriented languages. OK. So this is the best way to handle the effects coming out of these query compositions. We have the data source. We provide the data source. It reduces down to I.O. And then we just put it inside of a module pattern. We put it inside of a module pattern, and ta-da, there's our REST service. We access it from our REST service, and then we run the query, right? Straight through. Now, well, there's practical life that happens, which means you actually need to filter things. And when you need to actually filter things, you need to actually like, make modifications to the query to filter them. And it's easy for one thing, but what about multiple things? What if you want to filter by any column? What if you want to be able to filter by multiple columns? OK, we want to filter by multiple columns. What do we do? We need every single variation of the query, every single variation of every possible filter, right? That's impossible to do a static query with, right? You have to have dynamic queries. Uh, not quite. If you just swap in at the top level, right? You have a big query, composition, produces a query with columns. Swap in the filter into every single column. And guess what? If you don't want to filter by it, right? If it's not in the re request map, then just do a pass, right? Null is null. 
So just put it in, column by column, and here's the best part, right? Here's our map, name, age, those are the only two things we care to filter by. Guess what? Null is null for the columns that we don't care about. And database optimizers can see this. Database optimizers know this, right? There's no, there's no filter by null here because database optimizers dynamically swap in the values that they know it's going to have, right? Database optimizers are really good about these tiny little local optimizations that they can do, okay? So they actually swap in the filters that they need dynamically, and it's as though this is your static query, but it's as though these filters don't even exist. Now, okay, here's our, here's our output. Our uh, Rich Sherman retiring at the comfortable age of 59 with six houses. Anyway, so here's the neat part. You can do the same thing with the actual columns, right? We have this notion of filter push down and also predicate push down. Predicate push down filters the actual columns that we need to return. This is huge in columnar databases, right? Because it doesn't even, it doesn't actually have to even do the read at that point in the disk for a columnar database, right? So we just turn off the columns we don't need. And guess what? This is what the query planner actually sees. The query planner knows, oh, we don't care about these columns. Because case statements, if you just put a case statement for every single column, case statements that have static conditions are introspectable by database optimizers. Database optimizers can see into case statements that are statically defined, and it just evaluates them. Okay, so it just evaluates the case statements. Okay, and here it is, right? Notice, this is the database plan. For, for ID and HID, null, null. The query optimizers looks down into the query and says, oh, these columns are always gonna be null because this is statically evaluated as false, okay? So we just turn the columns off, but we still have a compile time known query. Okay, this really shines with GraphQL, right? Because in GraphQL, you naturally have this capability to turn on and off a column, to turn on and off a filter. Any arbitrary set of filters can be turned on and off. And this is where, you know, I have to really give Really give a, really give a clap to, to Pierre for creating the best GraphQL library I've seen in my career, which is Caliban. And I have to thank him so much for helping me and you know, writing, this, writing this API part for me, essentially. And so here's what you do, right? Here's your GraphQL query. You have a list of filters. This thing right here, product arguments, plugs into your query. You have this extractor called quill columns that lets you extract the set of columns that need to come out. And essentially, same thing. It goes down into the database optimizer directly, and the database optimizers know how to actually, like, only get the data that we asked. And by the way, here's the result set. So, oh, and by the way, here's your static query. So, static query that you get at compile time, dynamic optimization of queries at runtime that filters out all the columns that you haven't asked for and filters out all the rows that you haven't asked for, fairly small amount of code, and here's your query and here's the results. This is the future of querying. For almost, for really almost nothing in terms of code volume, you have completely dynamic compile Compile time, compile time query generation, but dynamic query optimization with predicate and filter push down for almost no code. This is the future of querying. So anyway, Scholar 3 brings us a lot of new capabilities. Zio is the best way to handle database effects that I've ever seen. Caliban and the Zio ecosystem really takes us one step further. Thank you, everyone. Wow.